Right, open your Bibles tonight at Hosea. 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 You can go down in South America. Bless you all, you and your house. Thanks for joining. Remember to get your bread and your wine ready, whatever you have in your house. When we finish with our message, we're going to have a communion service every Wednesday night. So tonight, a little bit again on revival. Everybody shout, revival. Desperately needed. Holy Ghost, revival. Come on, somebody that knows we need revival, shout, revive us. Revive us. Hosea, chapter 6. Blessed be the name of our God and our King. Bless you, Jesus. You know there. I will rejoice. Put your hand your Bible. Say, I pray for revelation knowledge to flow through the lips of Kubus into my ears, touch my very life. I believe this word is the anointed word of God. Kubis is anointed to teach it. I'm anointed to hear it. Atmosphere is anointed to carry it. So is our channel. In Jesus' name. Right, Hosea chapter 6. It's a great revival story. Come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn so that he may heal us. He has stricken so that he may bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. Quicken us. Give us life. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Yes, let us know. Let us recognize and be acquainted with and understand him. Let us be zealous to know the Lord, to appreciate, give heed to, and cherish him. His going forth is prepared and certain as the dawn. And he will come to us as the heavy rain, as the latter rain that waters the earth. Okay, everybody says he will revive us. He will come to us. Okay, so anybody that understands this is no maybe thing. This is no wishy-washy, well, perhaps type of thing. This is a promise, God will, God will, God will, God will. But from our side, let us return unto the Lord. That is more or less Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21, where Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. He says, uh, be con repent and be converted, so that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. So we need times of refreshing. We need times of revival. We need times of visitations. I mean, we're going on church day, you know, week after week. We preach, we have church, but then we become desperate and we realize it's not good enough. We love the Word. We love ministering to the sick. We love to see cripples walk. We love to see the power of God. But from time to time, you realize this is not good enough. We need a supernatural outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will do things that are out of our mind, that will do sudden stuff that we haven't expected, the things that the eye have not seen and the ear have not heard that has not come up in the heart of man. We need outpourings of the Holy Spirit from time to time. We call it revival. Bible. Now look at chapter 6 and let's go down to verse 6 and see, let, let's see the context here. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now just start turning to Habakkuk, just two or three books on. Habakkuk chapter 3. Now, just a reminder, everybody says God desires mercy and not sacrifice. Now, the whole context here is revival. It's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Is God coming to us like heavy rain, like the former and the latter rain that waters the earth. Okay? But if we go to the ministry of Jesus 2,000 years ago, 
This is what he loved to say to the Pharisees, especially in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus is talking to them, and he says, uh, I wish you would go and study and find out. So he says to the Pharisees, because they were the people that studied the law with the scribes, they were expecting Messiah to come, and when he came, they did not know it was him. And Jesus said, it is written, it is written, trying to prove to them everything written in the Psalms, the prophets, and the law about me, here I am to fulfill it. Okay? So he says to the Pharisees, I wish you would go and study to find out what it means, what is written. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And the context is there, Jesus talking to the law people and say, the law is coming to an end. Your sacrifices is not pleasing unto God. Your burnt offerings is not pleasing unto God. But there's going to be a final sacrifice which will bring about the mercy of God. And I want you to get the context here tonight. So Jesus is referring to God doesn't want another lamb to be slaughtered. God doesn't want another sacrifice. God doesn't want us to try and see how we can impress him. God wants us to understand Jesus brought a final sacrifice to bring about mercy. So let's look at the same context in Habakkuk chapter 3. Um, okay. My cross is hanging in my pocket. <laughs> a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, that is set to wild, enthusiastic, and triumphal music. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you, and I was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. Make yourself known in wrath. Earnestly remember mercy. Amplified would say love, pity, and mercy. King James would just say remember mercy. Okay? God approaching came from Timon, which represents Edom, the Holy One from Mount Paran in the Sinai region, Selah. Pause and calmly think of that. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. Verse 4. His brightness was like the sunlight. Rays streamed from His hand. And there in the sunlight splendor was the hiding place of his power. Now, just go to the King James for those who have the King James there. He says in verse 4, his brightness was as the light and he had horns out of his hand. And there was the hiding place of his power. So, uh, tonight you can turn so long to two places. You can go to Hebrews 10 as well as, I think it's Psalm 40. Yes, Psalm 40 would be right. Hebrews 10 and Psalm 40. God says, I don't want sacrifice. But mercy. Okay, when we come to Habakkuk, he says, uh, in wrath. Remember mercy. Okay? So the one is in Isaiah, Hosea, and the one is in Habakkuk. And both these portions talk about revival. Okay? So the A part there says uh, God will come to us. God will come to us. Uh, like heavy rain. Hoo hoo hoo. Let it rain, let it rain. I want some people to just help me preach. Okay, okay. God will come to us like the rain. He says, uh, there in the splendid sun-like glory is the hiding place. Of his power. Then he tried to explain that the hiding place of his power is horns. Now, both these scriptures talk about revival, but if we pick up the context in the life of Jesus, Jesus takes this whole thing and it refers to his sacrifice. as the Lamb of God. So Jesus, as the final sacrifice, brought about the mercy. So Hebrews chapter 10 tonight. Hebrews chapter 10. 
let's keep the atmosphere alive with expectancy, with excitement, and uh, with yes, Lord, do it tonight. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 10, as well as Psalm 40, open at both places at the same time. Okay, the word amen means my heart desires it to be exactly so. So you say amen when something good is said. You don't say amen when you realize you're in the meeting. And all of a sudden you woke up and realized, you know, I haven't said amen for a while. Amen, then you said it in the wrong place. Right, Hebrews 10, this message is really going to bless you tonight. Amen. Very, 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 very much. Verse 5. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, talking about Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you would not. But a body has thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will. Okay, just look at the board before we go to the other Psalms. So, I don't desire sacrifice, but I desire mercy. In wrath of God, remember mercy. So he puts this thing in the body of Jesus. Okay, anybody with me tonight? He says, you said you do not desire sacrifice or burnt offerings, but you have prepared a body for me. So we can take no sacrifice and wrath, and we can replace it with the body of Jesus. So the body of Christ on the cross took the wrath of God, and it brought about His mercy. So after the crucifixion, God's wrath is no more. God is not angry with you. God is not upset with you. If you understand what Jesus Christ did on the cross, if you go to Almighty God, the thing that's available is mercy. Okay? The twin brother of grace. So God is not angry. He took it out on Jesus. So I hope you can see this. So the body brought about the mercy. Okay? Is that clear enough? I don't have to try and explain it. So Psalm 40. Now you must remember, most of David's Psalms, when you read it, you can find the prophetic word about Jesus. That's why after the flesh, he was the son of David. But after the spirit, for us, he's the son of God. So we don't know Jesus in the flesh anymore. So for us, he's not a Jewish Jesus. He's a worldwide Jesus. God so loved the world. Okay? For 2,000 years ago, he first came unto the Jews. They received him not. So he said, now all that will receive me to them, give I the power to become the sons of God. Okay, so that's why the Bible says we do not know Jesus after the Christ after the flesh. So we don't know the son of David. We know the son of God. Okay, we don't know a Jewish savior. We know a worldwide savior. God so loved everybody. Mm -hmm. Now verse 5. Now don't criticize. First listen to some teachings before you say something. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonderful works which you have done and your thoughts towards us. No one can compare with you. If you should declare and speak of them, or if I should declare and speak of them, they are too many to be numbered. Okay, take that verse to heart tonight. Many, O oh Lord, are the wonderful works which you have done and your thoughts towards us. No one can compare with you. If I should declare and speak of them, they are too many to be numbered. Take that verse to heart before we read the rest. The psalm writer screams out and says, the wonderful works that God is doing towards me, the thoughts he has towards me is so great that there's no way I can try to number them. Have that in mind when we read the portion of Scripture. Verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, nor have you delight in them. You have given me the capacity to hear and obey. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not require. Stop and listen because you've got to get this word tonight. 
This is a prophetic psalm, and we're going to see it as we read on about the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, O Lord, sacrifice an offering you do not desire. There it is again. Okay? Now, what did we hear? But God desires mercy. What does Hebrews say? You have prepared a body for me. So here comes the psalm writer. He says, you do not desire that, but you have given me the capacity to hear and obey so Jesus comes along, especially in the book of, Psalm, of, of John, and he says, I, I do only what I hear. I speak only what I hear. My words is not my words, but the words that my Father speak to me. Okay, so in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, Father, let not my will be done, but let your will be done. So Jesus says, I cannot speak out of myself. What I hear, that is what I speak. I can only speak what I hear. So Jesus says, I've got an ear to hear from the Father and just say what He wants me to say. So I've got to do what He asked to do. So He asked me to go to the cross. So sacrifice and burnt offering God is not satisfied with. So He's prepared a me a body to become the final sacrifice so that mercy can come through. I hope somebody buddy, is listening. Okay? So just read on, verse 7. Then said I... Behold, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. Okay, I want to get excited, but I want somebody to see. We are in Hebrews 10. Keep your finger in Psalms. Let's just go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and look excited. For my sake. That I can hear I'm at least preaching to somebody. Okay. Verse 5. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, he says, sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body has thou prepared for me. He says it. In burnt offering and sacrifice for sin, you had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to do thy will, O God. Back to Psalm 40 and see if we can get you into the word tonight. Okay. Sacrifice and offering you would not. You did not desire. But you gave me the capacity to hear and obey. Come on, people. Then said I, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Yes, your law is written within my heart. Okay. God, not my will, but your will be done. Remember, verse 9. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great assembly, tidings of uprightness and right standing with God. Behold, I have not restrained my lips as you know, O Lord. I have not concealed your righteousness within my heart. I have proclaimed your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not hid away your steadfast love and your truth from the great assembly. Withhold not your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. Now, you can read the rest, but we are in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Let's read on. Mm -hmm. Verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Verse 9, then said he, lo, I come to do your will, O God. He take away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stand daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us 
For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of this is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh or his body, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope. Now this holding fast the profession, you can already start in chapter 3 and just pick it up right from chapter 3 in Hebrews chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter Amen, Kubeth. Are we all here? Let us return to the Lord because after two days He will revive us. So on the third day, we will live in His presence. He will come to us. He will revive us. He will bring us the heavy rain of revival. But we got to understand God does not desire sacrifice but mercy. O oh God, revive thy work. In wrath, remember mercy. And there in the sun-like splendor of his glory is horns in his hands, which is the hiding place of his power. Now, over and over, the psalm writer says, O oh Lord, you are my hiding place. Talking about David, he calls it the secret place. He calls it the hiding place. He calls it the pavilion. He calls it the most holy place. So God has got a place where he is hiding himself from the normal eye of humanity. Called the holy of holies or the most holy place. So here in Hebrews chapter 10, we know in the Old Testament they couldn't get there. But Jesus came yeah, thou hast prepared a body for me. So he takes away the first to establish the second. He takes away the fact that nobody could reach God. And he opened a place that now we can come boldly. So uh, this is all stuff we know, but tonight may God help us here. So we have boldness. To enter. I know you know this, but wait for about 15 minutes from now for new revelation. We have boldness to enter the Holy of Holies. Okay, we did it last Wednesday. We said that is also called the most holy place. That is called the secret place. Okay, that is called the tabernacle. Okay, that is called God's dwelling place. That is called the sanctuary. And tonight, it's called the hiding place. Okay. Of Almighty God. That's where the glory dwells. That's where the sunlight splendor of God Almighty is. Now, it says we can come boldly into this very place where God dwells. By the blood. And by the body. I think we did it last Wednesday. So the blood and the body, again, talks about the communion table of the Lord Jesus. You know, he says, uh, the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and said, this is my body. Amen. Then he took blood and he said, this is the new testament in my blood. Okay? This one is for the forgiveness of sin, and this is for all the blessings that you think you can get. So the body and the blood of Jesus, if you don't understand it by partaking in the communion table, you will never understand how you can boldly come into that place. And he says, so we can come there with a clear conscience. Because in the Old Testament, if you read, 
chapter 9 and chapter 10, verse 1, he says, uh, If the consciences of these worshipers could be cleansed with the Old Testament, they would have had no remembrance of sin. But they had to every year bring a new sacrifice because their consciences could not be cleared. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 says, But the blood of Jesus has cleared our consciences from dead works. He has sanctified us by the one sacrifice forever. You are holy. You are sanctified. You are justified. You are righteous. You're not growing into it. You're not going to get it when you get to heaven. You're not getting it when you die. He died to give it to you. See, so many people think, when I die, I'll reach perfection. When I die, I'll be righteous. When I die, I'll be holy. When I die, I'll be justified. No, He died so that you can be justified, sanctified, righteous, holy. You are it if you know what the body and the blood of Jesus did on the cross. So again, tonight's study, if somebody will just help me, it is about revival. And I, I wonder how many people will bring these scriptures together like we're going to put it together tonight. There it is in Hosea. There it is in Habakkuk. Oh man, the two greatest revival scriptures may be in the word of Almighty God. And and both of them are connected to you do not desire sacrifice, but you desire mercy. So both of those scriptures about not sacrifice, but mercy are taken directly to Psalm 40, the prophetic word about the crucifixion. You do not desire sacrifice, but you desire mercy. Taking it right to Hebrews chapter 10, you do not desire sacrifice. Now, now instead of mercy, he says, but you have prepared a body for me. For in the volume of the book, it is written of me, you have prepared a body. Now, different translation would say, in the scroll, it is written. It is written in the volume of the scroll. It is written in the book of the scroll. Some translations, so I just checked it out this afternoon, just says, in the scroll, it is written. In the scroll, it is written, you have prepared a body for me. So Jesus gave this body up to be crucified, his blood to be poured out of his body. And now because of this blood in this body, we can boldly come right into the very presence of God, the most holy place where there's horns, lightnings. Okay, Habakkuk says there's lightnings. There's thunders, and there's horns in his hands, which is the hiding of his power. Is that good? So again, just to back up to last Wednesday, if we go to Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 10 calls it the most holy place, but Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16 says the following, seeing that we have a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace to obtain mercy so that we can get grace for help in time just when we need it. Hmm. So this place in Hebrews chapter 4 is called the throne. Of grace for those who were here last week, Wednesday. So, the throne of grace. So, we can come with a clear conscience. Now, if we would read First John, the epistles of First John, chapter three and chapter five, he says, "If my conscience is clear, oh, what is happening now? Moi, if my conscience is clear, I didn't know this thing can do that." If my God, I've got it for two years and I didn't know there's stuff happening when you press the back of the thing there. Okay. okay. If my conscience is clear, 1 John chapter 3 and chapter 5 says, Whatsoever I ask, I'll get. So people believe that the holiest is open. They believe that we can come to God directly. Jesus said it from John 12 right to John 17. In that day when I'm crucified and the Holy Spirit is poured out, you can come directly to the Father. Whatsoever you ask, you receive. You can pray and God will give. You know, we know that is there. People know that, but they do not know that that body and blood has actually cleared your conscience, justified your conscience. There is nothing against you when you go to God. If you understand what Jesus paid for, if you say, Father, he says, whatever, son. 
You see, so there's something standing in our way, and tonight we've got to understand it. So there in Psalm 40, it says, You gave me an ear to hear. Oh, goodness, something is now, I did something wrong with this board of ours. Let's just get back to the original. Okay. Okay, you have given me an ear to hear and obey. Is that right? So Jesus heard and obeyed when the Father spoke. What did he do when he heard the voice of the Father and the world? He said, crucify me. By that, he took the wrath of God to bring about the mercy of God. So let's go tonight to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. Thank God for the rain. It's beautiful rain falling out here tonight. Mm. Okay. Okay, so quickly, before we read on, I've got to throw the scripture in again. We did it uh, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, as well as Sunday, portions of it where Jesus in John chapter 10 says, all those that came before me are thieves and robbers, you know, but when the shepherd comes, the, watch, uh, the watchman will open the door for him, and then Jesus said, I am the shepherd. And then he says something about the shepherd. He says, this shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. And then he says something so profound that we've been preaching now for about 12 years. He said, I am the door. Anyone that comes through me will be able to find pasture. So Jesus, same in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, the life, and... Okay. Way, the truth, and the life, okay? Jesus is the way. Jesus is the door. Where to? To the Father. Where's the Father? The Father is spirit, but where is He dwelling? On His throne, okay? Where's His throne? His throne is in the Holy of Holies. Where's the Holy of Holies? Behind the veil. What happened to the veil? It was torn apart. How? By the body of Jesus on the cross. What gives me entrance? The blood. How does the blood give me entrance? It clears my conscience. Okay? So Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more will the blood of Jesus wash my conscience? So the blood washes my conscience. The body opens the way, so I go through the crucified Christ knowing that his body was ripped apart. I can now come to the throne, but then my conscience must be cleared by the blood to make me able to say, Father, and he says, whatsoever. Yeah. So Jesus' body on the cross became the door into the Holy of Holies. So there was a thick veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the most, or the most holy from the holy place, okay? And only the high priest could go in once a year. But, you know, in this tabernacle that Moses built, years later Solomon built a temple, tried to make a replica of Moses' tabernacle. Now, in Hebrews, uh, in, uh, Acts chapter 7, uh, the, the writer says, verse 45, 6, 7, 8, and 9, he says, uh, uh, the ark of the covenant was with the people of Israel. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Now, I said it, but I don't think if anybody heard what I said, but I'll try it again. The ark of the covenant, or the ark of testimony, was with the children of Israel from the days of Moses till the days of David. That's all about the ark. Okay, just listen and get a revelation tonight if you've never got it. He says, who desired to build a house for God? But Solomon built him a house. But God does not dwell in a house built with hands. Okay? As, the, as it is written, what type of house will you build for me and what will be the place of my rest? Hmm? Are you ready? So, in the days of David, the ark was taken captive by the Philistines, and again taken captive by the Philistines. David brought it back the first time. We know Uzzah got killed because he did it the wrong way. Brought it back the second time. Remember, he was dancing in the presence of the Lord, put it by Obed Edom. His house was blessed. After three months, he brought it to his house, and now he was blessed, and he started writing all these songs about the holy place, because when he opened his door, there's the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, no veil, no nothing hiding it, just right there on his back door, you know, so they, woo, so he talks about the secret place, the pavilion, the hiding place, the power, and all of that. Hmm? 
So here comes the Philistines again. They take the ark. So Solomon built him a house. And he built it more or less like Moses built the tabernacle with the outer court, a holy place, and a most holy place with a thick veil to separate the two places in the tabernacle from one another. But this time, the ark does not look like the ark. It has no gold. It has no cherubims. Philistines stripped it from all the gold. It was just a wooden box without the pot of manna, without the rod of Aaron that budded. So all the supernatural were taken out of the ark and the only thing left in the ark was the law, the two tables of stone, but no gold. So Solomon, instead of building, making gold cherubims to overshadow the mercy seat, he put images on the wall. 20 feet, something big images. Okay, I'm losing interest. Uh, on the wall, two big cherubims. You know, but he pasted them on the wall. They're not overlooking the mercy seat. It doesn't look like God said to Moses what it must look like. So it doesn't represent anything. There's no cherubims on the ark. There's no gold over the ark. You can just read your Bible, okay? There's no pot of manna. There's no rod of air in that butter. So all the miraculous is taken out. Yet they have a most holy place. And yet the priests go once a year. God said, I'm not satisfied with your sacrifices. I don't want your sacrifices. God speaks out. He says, if you offer, it's like somebody slaughtering a pig, man. If you're offering, it's like somebody breaking, breaking a dog's neck, man. God is speaking out in all his prophecies. He says, I'm not happy with that temple. Hmm? Then comes the Babylonian captivity. So they break down the temple and take what is left of the ark, just a little wooden box. So Jeremiah prophesies, he says, you'll be in captivity for 70 years. When you come back, you will not replace the ark, rebuild the ark, revisit the ark. You will not even remember the ark. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, 16. And he says, if you decide not to do that, I myself will be present. Okay, so till today, people are looking for the ark and they want to rebuild the temple with the ark. God said, no, I'm going to take the first away and I'm going to establish the second. I don't want sacrifices. I don't want human temples. I want people to be my temple. I want people to understand I'm going to take my son who will hear my voice and when he obey what he has heard, he will say, God does not desire sacrifice. So here is my body prepared. It is written in the scroll. It is written in the scroll. Here is the sacrifice. Nail it to the cross. And that minute it will be opening the secret place, the holy place, the most holy place. And the blood will be there to make your conscience clear so that you can come boldly to the very presence of God. And God's presence, hey, 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 what will be too much for God to give you? So Jesus is the door to the throne. Jesus is the door to the most holy place. We all know it. I mean, I've been preaching it for years, since 1985. I've been preaching this stuff of the holy place, the most holy place, the secret place. So Revelation chapter 3. Verse 12. He who overcomes, who is victorious, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. He shall never be put out of it or go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Hmm? Verse 13, he who can hear, let him listen to and heed what the Spirit says. Okay, just listen. Just stay with me. I'm preaching, please. Uh, don't let your thoughts wander because you're missing every time that your thoughts were gone, you don't know where I was. So in Psalm 92, he says, the Lord have exalted my horn, my emblem of excessive strength like a wild ox or a buffalo. He says, because God has anointed me with fresh oil. Every sentence is weighed off. So I'm not saying anything that is not relevant to what I'm preaching. 
Thou have exalted my horn, my emblem of excessive strength, like a wild ox. You have anointed me with fresh oil. Then listen to what he says. I will be planted in the house of the Lord, and I will ever be full of sap, green, which means fresh. I will always be anointed if I can find out how to be planted in the house of the Lord. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar right in the house of God. He will not be moved out. Do you not know that you are God's dwelling place and secret place? So we bring the two together tonight. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Okay, now we have all the pictures, you know, Jesus standing at this door that is so full of, you know, stuff that has grown over it, and there's no knob on the outside because you're the only one that can open the door of your heart. The knob is on the inside. And we have these beautiful pictures of Jesus knocking at the door of your heart. He doesn't say he's knocking at the door of your heart. And he doesn't say you're the only one that can open the knob. Okay, just look at me. And this is not a salvation scripture either because he's talking to a church that needs to overcome. Write to the church and say, if you can overcome, I will make you a pillar. So church, this is how you will overcome to be a pillar. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Not salvation. Hmm? Not born again. Not coming to Jesus. A church that needs to hear, how can you overcome? Church, if you want to overcome, to be planted in the house of the Lord, to be anointed with fresh oil, with the horns, which is the hiding place of His power, you've got to understand that, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Listen to the rest. You have ears. And you can get, there's plenty of sermons of this stuff there that I've preached over the years. If anyone hears and listens and heeds my voice, and open the door, I will come into him and will eat with him and he will eat with me. Mm, Just wonder if I should do it now or later. Okay. Okay, just listen. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So if you hear my voice, so where is he knocking? Okay, thank you. If you hear my voice and open up, Jesus says over and over to the Pharisees, my word has no entrance in you. That's why you are not my sheep. John 10, my sheep hear my voice. And for them, I become the door. So they can come in. I am the good shepherd that lay down. But now I speak to you. Now remember Psalm 40. Sacrifice, burnt offering, you do not desire, you know. Uh, but what does it say? But God has given me an ear to hear and to obey the context of Jesus Christ. Okay, I don't want to struggle, so stay with me. It is for you. So he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, the context is, anyone that overcomes, I will give him to be a pillar. The one that is steadfast in the house, that means that can go into the Holy of Holies and dwell there. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. It's he that shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's that guy that have angels all around him. It's that guy that no evil shall come near him. No evil shall come near his dwelling place. It's that guy that is satisfied with length of days. Read Psalm 91. He that dwell, he that stays, he that abides behind the veil that has gone through the body and the blood of Jesus and know what it does. He will be protected. Nothing will. This car is protected by Psalm 91. (laughs) Oh, is it? You know? This house is protected by Psalm 91. Oh, is it? Listen to your words. It's not. You know, if it's there, you don't have to proclaim it. It'll happen automatically. So somebody will get it here tonight. So how will I abide there? I've got to overcome something to abide there. Now he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open, I will come in to you and we will eat together. Now Jesus says exactly the same thing in John 14. 
Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, now believe in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. We discussed it. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. You are a dwelling place of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Going on that same scripture, if that scripture talks about heaven, then the rest of chapter 14 will not make sense. Because he says, if you are prepared a dwelling place, this is what will happen. Are you ready? I will pray the Father, and he will send you the Comforter. And then the works that I do will you do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to the Father. So the preparing of the dwelling place is for you to receive the fullness of the Spirit so that you can do the greater works of Jesus. Then he repeats, when I go, I can send the Spirit. He says, now he goes on to verse 22, 3, 4, and he says, and I and the Father will come and make our dwelling in you. And then we will sup together. Okay? Now we know what the eating of Jesus talks about. He says, I have meat that you know not of. And my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. So please listen. If Jesus talks about eating together, he talks about we are co-laborers. Let's work together. Let's get the sick healed. Let's get the dead raised. Let's get the gospel preached. Okay? The works that I do shall you do also in greater works. So Jesus refers to works as eating, as doing the will of the Father. So he says, if you hear my voice, we can eat together. So if you hear what I say, you will overcome something that will make you able to be filled with the Spirit, that will make you able to do the greater works that Jesus promised you will do. See the context. Is it okay? I hope I'm making sense because I, I've got to look at faces, okay? Verse 21, listen. He who overcomes, he who overcomes, you've got to hear it tonight. As I myself overcame... And sat down beside my father on his throne. He who is able to hear, let him hear. Okay, please, draw from me, man. Draw, draw, I've got to give. So he says, if you hear my voice, that'll be opening the door. That'll be overcoming something that'll make you able to receive the fullness of the Spirit, to be able to do the greater works of the Father, and if you overcome like I overcame, he gave me an ear and I heard, not sacrifice, but body, here I am. So I paid the price so that you can get the benefits. If you can understand this cycle, I will sit on the throne, but you will sit on the throne with me. Hmm? Maybe I should jump myself ahead. Go to chapter 5, verse 5. I'll run ahead of myself and come back. Then one of the elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin said to me, Stop weeping. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root, the source of David, has won, has overcome and conquered. He can open the scroll and broke, break its seven seals. Okay. I don't want to run ahead of myself, but... Keep your finger there in John chapter 3 and quickly go to John 6, of the Revelation 3, excuse me, John 6. You get it now. If you didn't get it up till now, you're going to get it now. Look at my eyes and look like intelligent, like your IQ rose above 147. You wish. Okay, 26. <laughs> twinkle, twinkle, little star. Okay. Verse 26. Jesus answered them, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, you have been searching for me not because you saw miracles and signs, but because you were fed with the loaves and were filled and satisfied. Look, Jesus said to the people that followed him after he multiplied the bread, you know why you follow me? You ate bread. Now remember what he just said about open the door. When you hear my voice, we will eat together. He says, you eat bread. That's why you follow me. You shouldn't follow me to eat that type of bread. Listen to verse 26 or 27. Amplified, and then we're going to go to the King James. Stop toiling and doing and producing for food that perish and decompose in the using. But strive and work and produce for the lasting food 
which endures unto life eternal. The Son of Man will give you, will furnish you that. For God the Father has authorized, certified him, and put his seal of endorsement upon him. King James. For him, God the Father sealed. Then said they, what can we do that we can be working the works of God? Do you see the working the works of God is directly again eating the food? Eating the food is doing the works of him that sent me. Okay, so if you have ears to hear, you can do the works. But how can you do the works? By receiving the Holy Spirit. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? You know, uh, uh, Jesus had to go into the heavenlies to receive the promise of the Father, then he poured it out. Acts chapter 2. And the Amplified says, this is the beginning of that which was spoken by the prophet Joel that says, in the last days I will pour out of my spirit. So portions were poured out 2,000 years ago. But if we look to Hosea 6 and, and Nahum and Habakkuk and Zechariah and, uh, you know, chapter 10 of Zechariah and that, there's got to be a greater outpouring. The heavy rain has not fallen yet. So for heavy rain, there's got to be a lot of lightnings. There's got to be a lot of thunders to get a heavy rain. The heavier the rain, the more the lightnings, the more the thunders. Is that okay? So I have conquered. Mm -hmm. Sit on the throne. Let's just keep on reading. He who is able to hear, let him hear. Now remember, the Bible was not written in chapters. Chapters are there for you to easily memorize it. But when you go to the original text, it was just one letter. John didn't write, oh, chapter 1, and then the next day. You know, like, hi, John. You know, every now and then God gave him another chapter. John, chapter four. <laughs> oh, after two months on Patmos, he appeared to me again and said, John, chapter four. You know, no, John saw a vision and he wrote it down. It was one vision, you know. So they were not at chapter three and four. So he was writing, writing, writing. You overcome. Still one writing, 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 writing. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. King Amplified would say more or less the same as chapter three. A door standing open in heaven. And the first voice that was like a trumpet. Now, where did you hear the voice like a trumpet? Chapter 1. I, John, your brother in the kingdom and tribulation, was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a voice like many waters behind me. And when I turned around, I saw him, Son of God, you know, white hair, you know, fiery eyes, feet burning bronze, golden girdles. And he said, I am the voice I am, I was dead, but I am alive. I've got the keys of death and hell. I have conquered. Yeah. Hmm? So that same voice spoke to him when he saw the open door. Ah, oh, I saw a door. I, John, saw a door. Now remember John's over 100. I, John, saw a door. I, John, saw a door. Okay, well, John was over 100, man. I, I saw a door open in heaven. He's talking about, I want to make you a pillar. I want you to be in the house. I want you to be in the holy place. I want you to be where my presence is. I want you to be flooded with my spirit. I want us to eat together. In other words, I want us to work together. I want you to do my works. I want you to go on with the Holy Spirit power. Thank you for the greatest crowd that's listening. I take it for those that, I take it they don't understand English. Okay, it's all right. Okay. A door opened in heaven. The first voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must be here after. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Okay, what did he just say? If you overcome like I overcame to sit on the throne, you will sit with me on the throne. So I saw a door open. John 10, I am the door. What made the way for Jesus to, for us to go into the Holy of Holies? The veil. Which veil? His flesh. You have prepared a body. What did the body become? The door that was beaten for us to go through the crucified Christ, knowing that he became the way to the Father. Nobody can come to the Father but by me. So, so we think, oh, I got to pray in the name of Jesus, otherwise my prayers will not be answered. Hey, what about just screaming, help, and God helps. 
Okay? So we got to understand the power of the crucified Christ, the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. That's why we have communion services, and that's why Jesus said, do it as often as you can and proclaim my death, because it's in his death that we got life. It's through his body on the cross that the door is open. How can we go boldly to the throne of grace, boldly to the most holy, to the sanctuary, to the hiding place, to the dwelling place, to the secret place, to whatever. And immediately as I was in the spirit, and I behold, a throne was set in heaven, one sat on the throne. And he that sat looked like a jasper and a sod and stone. You've got to read Exodus when Moses saw it. There was a rainbow round the throne, a sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne were 420 seats. Upon the seats I saw 420 elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now listen to verse 5. See if you can see Habakkuk. And out of the throne proceed lightnings. And thunders and voices. Okay, just stop there for a moment, please. Pause. I'm not going to write. You can get the message now. I'm... Let us return to the Lord. Let us seek to know Him. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, we will live in His presence. He will come to us like the heavy rain because He don't desire sacrifice but mercy. So we got to understand the context. Revive thy work, O Lord, in the midst of the years and wrath, remember mercy because God has got lightnings, sunlight, lightning power. And there's the horns, which is the hiding place of His power. In wrath, remember mercy. Do you, can, does it make sense? Okay. So listen to this. Listen to this. Out of the throne proceed lightnings and thunders. So what's coming from the throne? Rain. Ah, <laughs> oh, forgive me for not explaining it good enough. Okay. He will come to us like the heavy rain. Heavy rain needs lightnings and thunderings. Let us return to the Lord. Okay, if you read Hosea chapter 5, it says, I will go to my place on high. And when they repent from their offenses, what will happen? Then we will go to him and he will revive us and come to us like the heavy rain. So he says, if we come out of our fleshly carnal, please go knowing that the body of Christ on the cross became the door for me to enter through if I hear his voice. I can then go eat with him. I can then get thunders and lightnings, which will bring heavy rain. Yeah. Okay, if it does make sense, all right. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So what do I find before the throne? The seven spirits of God, which is lamps burning. Now remember, when he saw the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3, he saw lampstands, not lamps with fire. The fire is inside the throne room. The lampstands were outside. So he says, John, tell the church if they can see the throne, come up here to get the fire on the stand. So the church is born again. The church is saved, but not on fire. So tell the seven churches they got to overcome to hear my voice, to come through the door into the most holy place that we can get the sevenfold spirit, the fire on their lampstands so that the church can be a flame for God. That's why we talk about revival fires. That's why we talk about the great awakening. That's why talk the fire is burning. Have you got the flame? That's why they talk about the flames of revival burnt over Wales in 1904 and over America in 1906. So if I get there, what will I find? Lightnings and thunders. What does it say? Heavy rain. This is how it will come to us. The next point. Fire. Yeah. Seven lamps on fire. Hmm? The sevenfold spirit of God. Now, what did we read in John chapter 6? He says, if you want to eat my food, if you want to eat together, you've got to understand I've been sealed with the spirit of God to do this bread thing. Right? Now, John chapter 6. Um, the next verse, Jesus says, I am the bread. 
So you eat me, my body, my blood, so to do what? To do my works. So I partake of what he did on the cross to receive the Spirit. So the end result is I got to get the fullness of the Spirit so that I can do the greater works. Jesus was sealed with the sevenfold Spirit of God. Spirit of God is upon me. Okay, Not in me. He was born of the Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit, yet he had the Spirit upon him, sealed upon Spirit of wisdom, spirit of knowledge, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of might. Isaiah 11, there's a sevenfold spirit of God upon him to seal him. That's why when Jesus died, you had to give up the spirit before they could kill him because he was sealed. Father has sealed him and endorsed him to do what? To do miracles, signs, and wonders. How does he do miracles, signs, and wonders? By the fullness of the Spirit. So if I can get the sevenfold fiery burning Spirit of God upon me and be filled with that Spirit, I will do the works of Christ. But I've got to understand it's there. Revive. Heavy rain. Fire. Throne room, holy of holies, return to the Lord. Come boldly. Don't let your conscience stand in the way. Believe what we're praying for. If we take the bread and drink the cup, know why we're doing it. For a greatest outpouring. Yeah. Are you getting it? So there's Hebrews 3. I hope you see it. Okay. So chapter 5. And I saw lying on the open hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll. Written, okay, nobody, so it's all right. Within and without, on the back, closed and sealed with seven seals. John 6, 27. Hmm. Well, let's just read Hebrews chapter 10. I'm not going Hebrews chapter 10. You've got to know now. And I saw a strong angel announcing in a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll. Who is entitled and deserves and is morally fit to break its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth in the realm of the dead were able to open the scroll or to take a look at its contents. And I wept audibly and bitterly because no one was found fit to open the scroll or to inspect it. Then one of the elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin said, Stop weeping. See the line of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has won, overcome, conquered. Remember chapter 3. He can open the scroll and broke its seven seals. And there between the throne and the four living creatures, beings, and among the elders of the heavenly, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Seven horns. Remember, Habakkuk is in his hands. And, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. He just called them in chapter 4, seven fiery lamps which he sent to all the earth. Thank you. And then he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, all having a harp, and, you know, and they had golden bowls full of incense, Saturday night's message, which were the prayers of God's people. Incense. Come on, Saturday night, get the meeting. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to break the seals that are, for you are slain. How did he break the seals? By being slain. Okay, look at that. Jesus is hanging on the cross. His body, he can't die. So he said, Father, he gave up that which sealed him, the sevenfold Spirit of God. He gave up the Holy Spirit. He gave it up. Then he said, It is finished. Then he said, Into thy hands do I commit my spirit. First, he had to give up this spirit sevenfold that sealed him, that made him to be able to do signs, wonders, and miracles. Oh, okay. Anybody just shout for once. Thank you. And they sang, you were slain, and you have purchased us out of every tribe, language, people, and you have made us a kingdom and priest to our God, and we shall reign on earth. How far can I go? Sacrifice an offering you desire not. You have prepared a body for me. It is written in the scroll. <laughs> it is written in the volume of the book. So before Jesus was, there was the scroll written. 
So that word became flesh. You prepared a body for me. So the scroll took on the form of flesh. Now the scroll is written. The Word of God walks around. He does everything what the Father says. He has an ear to hear. So this scroll is sealed. That's why they can't kill him. He's sealed. He said, I'm sealed with the Spirit of God. That's why I do these miracles. This is my bread. So who can break the seals? Jesus said, nobody can take my life. I've got to lay it down. So the lamb is worthy to take the body, lay it down, give up the ghost, break the seals. And he overcame by doing that. Now, all you've got to do to overcome is hear what he says. What does he say? He says, just open your ears and hear. What do you hear? Come up through the crucified Christ. Take the body, eat it. Take the blood, drink it. Say, this is how the price was paid. Receive a clear conscience. Then come, return to God and say, Father, send the rain. Pour out your spirit. Lightning, thunders, heavy rain. And you'll be set on fire. And the greatest revival will break out. You'll be filled with the spirit of Almighty God. Let's look at two portions. Closing. Amen. Acts chapter 2, the first outpouring. And Ephesians 5, the promise of the second outpouring. Okay, don't get theological about it. I'm just... Amen. 2011th outpouring, whatever you want. I'm just trying to state, make a statement. Thank you. We got one hallelujah from that side. Thank you. Yes, somebody needs to go there and help. Spirit is now poured out. Yeah, they're having church there by themselves. They just woke up. Okay. Sick people that's been sleeping, they just woke up so they heard church. Okay. Okay. They all now filled with the Holy Spirit. We're closing. Verse 12, but the people were amazed. Verse 13, other people were mocking, saying, These are full of new wine. Now you've got to listen to this. In then Peter stood up and said, These people are not drunk. Comma, as you suppose. So in other words, Peter said, I acknowledge they drunk. <laughs> but not as you suppose. Because they said they're full of new wine. Peter said, I acknowledge they are drunk, but not with wine. They are drunk, but not with wine. I, I acknowledge, if I look at them, they look good, they drunk, they drunk, okay? As you suppose. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Hmm? Amplified, this is the beginning of that. Now listen to verse 22. Get the revelation, we're closing. You men of Israel, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, now listen to this and take it back to John 6, 27. Take it back to John 14. Take it back to Revelation 3, 4, and 5. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited, pointed out, and shown forth, and commended and attested to you by God, by the mighty works and the power of performing wonders and signs, which God wrought through him, right in the midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, when delivered up according to the definite and fixed purpose and settled plan and full knowledge of God, you crucified, put out of the way by the hands of lawless and wicked men. But God raised him up. Hmm? Verse 30. Okay, 30, 32. This Jesus God raised up of all that we, his disciples, are now witnesses, being therefore lifted high. By and to the right hand of God. Remember the right hand of God. And having received from the Father 
the promised blessing, which is the Holy Spirit. He has made this outpouring, which you yourselves see and hear. So if we have such an outpouring, people will see it and people will hear it. Oh, we had great church last night. Says who? Did somebody see it? Did somebody hear it? Then it was not the outpouring. It was just another religious organization. You play church like you play golf. You pay tithes like club fees. And you come and make sure your seat is reserved for next Sunday. Now what about, my Lord, I've got to have an ear. I've got to be filled. I've got to be anointed. I've got to get fresh outpouring. I've got to get lightnings and thunders. I've got to get fire. I've got to get revive us, oh Lord. Hmm? Ephesians 5. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine. Oh, you know what was just said in Acts chapter 2. Now listen to this. For that is debauchery. But ever be filled with the Spirit. Okay. okay, can I help you? That's the only time from the book of Acts. In all of the epistles, that's the only time the word is filled. The word filled is used in the Bible. In the New Testament. Acts, and in all Paul's epistles, that's the only time he says, be filled with the Spirit. What is the context? Okay, thank you. These are not drunk as you suppose with new wine. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, do you want a revival? Do you want an outpouring like never before? You'll be, you must be prepared to get drunk. You must be prepared to get supernaturally zapped in the spirit. If you want the supernaturally outpouring, you must be prepared to say, my goodness, I can come right to the throne. I can come right into the Holy of Holies. I can come right to where the glory dwells. The scroll was taken. Jesus became, the word became flesh. The seals was broken on the cross. Now we can enter and say, oh my goodness, everything that Jesus paid the price for and after the price, this is the promise, the output, of, I can have it all. So Jesus took bread and thanked the Father. And after he took the bread, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. So tonight we thank you as we stand here by this image of a crucified Christ. We thank the Father for the body. And the ushers just help those people there at the back, please. Because they're walking around. So Jesus took bread and said, this is my body, broken for you. And I hope somebody tonight is going to get some revelation. I try my best with what I have to give to you some revelation tonight. I hope somebody saw the importance of the bread, the body, the cup, the blood. I hope somebody saw it. If you didn't see, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I think you will not get this type of teaching anywhere it's like, just like that. I think God has really been speaking to us for weeks now about Jesus laying down his life, being the door opened for us to enter the most holy. And if we enter tonight, just by eating and drinking, we can be filled we can be anointed with fresh oil and we can all get drunk tonight in the spirit. You can get drunk right there in your house. So tonight I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, minister to you the bread and the wine if you're not prepared to get drunk and filled. If we are not prepared to have a revival tonight, I'll go eat the bread privately in my prayer room. I got this message from God Almighty. 
you can hear, you can't work these messages out with concordances. You've got to get it from God. How do you connect these scriptures but by the Spirit? So tonight, we are in desperate need of revival. Hosea 6, Habakkuk 3, Psalm 40, Hebrews chapter 10, Revelation 3, 4, and 5, and I hope you got the message. Huh? Okay? I could have just spoken to you, but I want you to read it. So do you see this body and this bread that we take is actually to take you to the greatest outpouring. It's actually, if we understand what we do, we can get, we can take this bread tonight and eat it. And if we take that cup, that little bit of grape juice, you can get so drunk. Hmm? Where's hope? Can we sing, I see a land thirsty and dry. Let it rain. Is hope here? Can we sing it? And we're going to sing it once or twice. You and your house, join us. Go get your bread ready. And then we're going to take the body of Jesus, that broken bread. We're going to take that cup. And we're going to say, if I eat this, I mean, if, you, if I get totally filled tonight with that sevenfold spirit that Jesus broke the seal of, to open the door for us to get the promise. Nothing shall be impossible. No burden that you cannot break. No problem that you cannot solve. No sickness you cannot heal. No demon that you cannot cast out. No victory that you cannot achieve. No success that you cannot have. Hmm? Amen. Amen. So Jesus took the bread and said, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat it, you proclaim my death till I come. And tonight, we've got to understand, if I eat this bread, I'm going to understand that I can go directly to the throne. I can sit there. I can hear the voice. I can see the thunders and the lightnings. I can get the rain, and I can get the supernatural revival. So before we eat it, let's sing. Let's all stand. Was it okay? Did anybody get this? Amen.